Sounds good. I'm live. You're good. Okay, good. Excellent. So can you please uh, introduce yourself? Please? Yeah. Uh, my name's Andrew Sutton. Um, uh, I think of myself as from Earth, <laughs> um, mostly because for the large part of my dance career, I traveled every week of the year somewhere different for uh, 12 years, like basically um, 200 55 cities across 38 countries, I think is the current count, um, all to teach and research dance. And uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm one of the, I think what I'd call a founder of the fusion movement um, in that like uh, um, Ivy Gray came up with the idea of the fusion exchanges and came to me and thought, oh, like, this is something I want to do. And I consulted with her with the very first Fusion Exchange and then became a co-organizer of the next six, I think, Fusion Exchanges or however many, all but the last one, last one I got to attend. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, I was the one who defined Fusion as, fu uh, Fusion is fusing your movement to the music and with your partner or with your partner in the music. Um, being the goal of being able to dance with anyone to any music, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think some people call it, uh, it got named Fusionist Philosophy, I think was one of the ways it's being called. Um, yeah, which mm -hmm. is all right. I think there's probably a more accurate name for it, but I haven't come up with it yet. Okay. Uh, can, you, anyway. can you tell me about like that, how you got into, like what is your entry into this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it all actually started from... Uh, it was a dance at the Fillmore in San Francisco um, where a bunch of dancers from L.A. came up to dance with the San Francisco scene. And the, and I was from Santa Barbara. And so I'd seen the L.A. dancers. I'd seen the San Francisco. And when they came up, it was almost like they thought, like, you're not doing Lindy Hop. What is this dance you're doing? It's so different, right? So the there were two styles of lindy hop that were so different they didn't even recognize each other didn't feel comfortable dancing with each other like you know they'd try but it, it was awkward um at times and so for me it was like i really want to be able to dance with everyone you know and so that started my search and i even created the website smoothsavoy.com which is the combination of smooth style what's the la style and savoy style the san francisco style um and uh, and on my search of, like, how do I dance with everyone, there was an uh, instructor that said, you know, if you really want to dance with everyone, you can't just learn all styles of Lindy Hop. you got to learn all styles of dance because there's people that come into Lindy Hop with other dance backgrounds that might be more prominent in their dancing than their Lindy Hop. And if you want to rock it out with them, you can't just be like, you're wrong for not doing it my way, right? you got to find out how to do it and make it work for them. Um, so that really kind of opened my mind to start taking uh, a lot more styles of dance. And then, and then at some point, like I was like, I wanted to change how I learned dance because the way we learn dance, we learn a, a technique like counterbalance or something like that. And then we can use that when somebody else knows that technique. But if someone didn't take that class or didn't learn that technique, we couldn't use it. And so my goal was, well, how do we, like, t take these really cool things we're learning and make them universal so that we can actually use them with everyone that we dance with rather than just that one person? So that became my mission is to always take everything I learned and just go, okay, how do I readjust the, the concept around this so that I can use it with everyone instead of one person? Mm -hmm. And that really, like, for me was the beginnings of fusion, right, was this, like, okay, I got to fuse whatever I'm doing with this other person, fuse every technique I learn with another person or another dan uh, another style of music, right? Because it doesn't make sense to bounce down to a song that just doesn't feel like it should have a down bounce or something like that. Um, and uh, so that's that's kind of, for me, the fusion aspect of it. Like, and, the, and blues kind of came through that a little bit. But for me, it was like it was the blues side of it was more like a, a another thing to learn to be able to help me dance with everyone. Not like my goal was never to like dance blues and only blues or something like that. It was more I want more arsenal of things. Um, 
And then we'd go to like house parties and people play, you know, some blues music was that played because I felt like it was a good way to push us outside of our box of like, like we're Lindy Hoppers. This blues music is close enough to Lindy Hop that, that, um, that it's not completely uncomfortable to dance to, but different enough that we should change the way we dance. Our swing outs need to adjust. Everything we do should be adjusting to match that music. Um, so blues was common, but it, I felt like we also danced to rock and roll and heavy metal and all sorts of other things as well, you know? Um, and I think like for me, the, the parties that stood out the most were, um, Dave Madison's parties, the Lindy booty party, um, which also like coincidentally was one when he ran one of his Lindy booties. Um, one of the nights was actually at the warehouse, which was my place in Sacramento, um, mine and Dan Prince, also one of the guys that, uh, started the fusion scene in Sacramento. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So, um, uh, how, uh, so you just talking a little bit about sort of your entry into it, which yeah. is what I asked, of course, but, um, uh, how do you sort of like, how did the sort of like a group of like-minded people form around this? Like what? Well, how did the scene form? Yeah, uh, and when you're saying the fusion scene, would you ask or or well, I mean the uh, blues or yeah, actually, how, well, well, I mean, like I, I guess you could expand to say like what was going on at that moment. You can you can if the story involves the blues scene, it does, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay. like yeah, what is your story there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my story around that, like, it was we were going to dance events, you know, and Lindy Hop dance events, and we'd be dancing until. Uh, you know, 7 a.m. sometimes, like, I'd say 5 a.m. was more normal, but sometimes 7. Um, and uh, and once it hit midnight, it was like time to slow things down, you know? We're getting tired, let's slow things down. So the music became more soul music, blues music, um, uh, different funky things to just to push us outside of our box, but slower stuff. Um, so that was a big thing that was happening all over, like all over in the, definitely in the U S. Um, and, um, and then there were house parties going on as well. That's like Lindy Booty or, uh, Dave Madison's thing. The warehouse was throwing them. That was, uh, me and Dan's place. Um, and, uh, and we were throwing parties like basically just to get people to hang out. And those parties, I feel like the same, like we would start playing funkier music, you know, maybe midnight, maybe even earlier on those, those events. We start much sooner. Um, and, uh, I, I think I, there was a little bit of like, like this, um, how do I say? The atmosphere was one of either like, this badass raw music it had this that's my best explanation is like the music was just badass and made you feel cool when you danced you know um or it was like hot and sexy and made you like want to like like actually feel romantic feelings toward your partner right like those often happened i wouldn't that wasn't always uh but i feel like those styles tended to go uh a lot more in the in the uh, house parties, you know, anything we could really feel like, like, yeah. Um, and, and that culture was just, you know, that was our only thing for a while. We were, we were only doing house parties or late nights at, uh, at Lindy events was our only outlet for this. Um, and it was, it was, uh, sporadic enough that, you know, we'd get a bunch of people from San Francisco and Sacramento and drive all the way up to Seattle for a single night of dancing, you know, at someone's house. Uh, I forget, there was a, a woman named Janet. That's all I remember. She, like, threw this epic house party that we all drove up for. Um, and we did multiple of those. That was the Seattle one. There was also Portland was throwing some parties. And, and they would come down for parties in San Francisco and Sacramento and things like that. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so I feel like that, 
started that culture. It really was out of the Lindy Hop scene for me. Of course, I was a Lindy Hopper, right? Like, and that's the interesting thing about the the fusion movement is like it really co- coalesces around the organizer and their dance style, right? So if people get into it from salsa, it's likely because their organizer is salsa, learned a little bit about this fusion thing, and is like, oh, let's do it in the salsa world, right? Um, so wherever you go, it can be drastically different or slightly different. It really just depends on the organizers and how they create their scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, like, what you're just uh, so were people calling it fusion at that time, or what, no? What was the, uh, well, was so, there a name at all attached to it? I mean, I, the first it, it was just Lindy Booty was the first like name that I, we had, which was just a silly way to say like you know we're having fun, um, and uh, it was Lindy uh, Ish, right? Lindy Ish. <laughs> um, at some point, people started calling it blues, and I have no idea why. Like, other than like. Yeah, we played a fair amount of blues music, but we also played rock and roll and all sorts of other stuff. So, like, for me, I never, like, was like, oh, yeah, it's got to be blues. Um, It's just what people called it. So that's also what I started calling it for a little while until, um, you know, I think Damon Stone and Heidi Fight were like, hey, hey, wait, that's not blues. This is blues, and we're showing something else. And, um, And it was around that time that, like, like uh ivy had her idea of the fusion exchanges and we're like well fusion is such a better word for it anyway we should just start calling it fusion um and uh and so it sort of morphed and then you know for a little while there were people that were like well maybe we'll call it blues fusion i know dan uh, in sacramento uh was calling it blues fusion for a while um and uh and yeah, some people were calling it turquoise because they had this feeling of, like, it, it had some roots in blues. Um, for me, like, I never connected with that, like, it has its roots in blues as much as, like, like I would say it more had, for me, it more had its roots in Lindy Hop than blues, for sure, like, from, from my perspective. Um, but sure, it was impacted by blues and every other dance form that came in and we could you know share an idea and go oh this is how we can dance better with a partner um but uh yeah so there there was a there was a time frame where i was calling it blues and even even after that before fusion came i started calling it warehouse blues because i had didn't come up with fusion yet but uh but Damon and Heidi and others were saying, no, don't call it blues. It makes some difference. And I was like, okay, well, maybe warehouse blues? Like, um, but, yeah, as soon as Fusion came through, it was like, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So, so wh- how did you come up with that name, Warehouse Blues? Uh, warehouse Blues because we were throwing parties at the warehouse, right? Like, and it, while Dave Madison's place wasn't technically a warehouse, it still had that vibe that I feel like the warehouse had as well. Um, but it was something that like, like I could say it was clearly different, right? It's something that people have to go, wait, what is this? So they're going to ask about it. And then it was something, well, we were throwing parties at our warehouse. So like, we can call it that, like, at least our version of it makes sense that way. Um, so that was the, the safest like way that I could come up with at the time that tried to respect everyone, you know, um, can you, so can you can you say a little bit about how that because it seems like it was one scene that sort of split off into these two different things right Blues yep. and fusion. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about that process yeah um i mean my perspective from how the blues scene went is one more from out and outside i would say in that like i i've been to a i don't know maybe five or ten blues events in my life but i've been to hundreds of fusion events and maybe even like 500 lindy events right so like not nearly as much in the blues world um uh but my perspective of it was you know there um there were people that were that were trying to share what they learned as blues and uh and that started some classes and i know definitely in san francisco area there were some classes and then eventually they held their own like blues event where they were just doing a blues event. Um, and there was a lot of crossover at that point, you know, cause they're, 
they were, I think at that point, marketing to those of us that had this name of blues, right? So, so that was their audience. And so there was a lot of fusion dancers or what we later might have been called fusion dancers or Lindy Hoppers or things like that, that were learning this more, uh, what I would call pure blues. Um, uh, and, um, and then the fusion scene, like, even the fusion scene has its own pockets of different styles of fusion that we're splitting off and going, oh, this is what fusion is for me, or this is what fusion is for me. Um, and so, like, you have the recesses that were, at, at the time, were still blues recesses, and eventually got rid of the blues part of it and just went with recesses. Um, you had the fusion exchanges, which were a little bit more, um, like the, the recesses were, I feel like the spirit of fusion, if that makes sense. Like it was, it was more a fusion of community. And I think the fusion exchanges were a fusion of skill and like dance knowledge. And the, like, for me, it wasn't even just dance knowledge. It's just any knowledge you have of moving your body in any way martial arts like or even a chef like stirs a pot right that's a motion that he's doing like every motion that we do in life um is something to take into play like so it's really for me the fusion exchanges were about like learning more about how to move more ways that we can better dance with more people um and uh there's a third community which what's the third community of the fusion um, I'm blanking on it right now. Huh. Oh, well, I think then there was like, um, there was the blues tango, like community that was like specifically trying to fuse those two dances. Um, and, uh, and I think that was a pretty strong contingent in the, it's definitely in the San Francisco area. There was like, uh, maybe a monthly dance or something that was going on for that. Um, and uh, I think I lost track of what the original question was. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, no, that, that's a lot of the questions that I was, that I was, had, had come with. Are, are there other things that you want to sort of like, that are like I missed or that, you're, that you think are important to talk about? Maybe in terms of the development of, of what's happened huh. since then or... or? Or anything else? The development of it. I mean, I know what I'm passionate about when sharing fusion. Well, like, let me know. Um, to me, fusion is about fusing with your partner in the music. And I know a lot of people think, well, that's every dance. And I would say, ideally, yes. But the way that we learn almost every dance, like, there's exceptions, but... I would argue those exceptions are people that are teaching fusion without realizing it. <laughs> um, but most people are teaching the style as the priority and then the connection with the partner and the music as the secondary, right? So it's actually not until you get your steps down that you start to learn how to connect with the partner and the music. And even, I would argue, even when you do start to learn to connect with the partner and the music, it tends to be more... Uh, style of connection rather than what I would say is a universal connection of learning like how does counter like the difference would be with counterbalance you learn to go in and out of counterbalance at very specific moments in the dance or you learn how counterbalance works so that you can go in and out of it whenever you want based on what your partner is doing right two very different ways of learning counterbalance most most dances you learn do the first one where you actually learn moments to do it whereas fusion i would say if you're going to teach counterbalance ideally you're teaching them to be able to do it at any moment in any movement right so they can do it with any partner at any moment so, so um, can, can you get into that like maybe the the, the technical details of that like beyond counterbalance as well like like the Give me like a rundown of as much as you want. Of, yeah. of, 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 <laughs> I could talk about yeah, this yeah. for ages. Oh, please. Do. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, the first thing that brings to mind is like, like, how do we like 
create things to be universal, right? Because that's kind of the trick. And it, as far as I know, it really hasn't been done. It's something that like, like us as the dancers have to start to discover and look at. And I don't know that we'll ever perfect it. It's like the, I always say like fusion is the easiest dance to start, but the hardest dance to master if we, and I don't know that it's a dance, but you get the concept is it's easiest to start because it's your partner's job to fuse with you, right? So their job is to make whatever you do awesome. So it's super easy to start because everything you're doing, like they're just figuring out, oh, okay, I can make this awesome this way or that way, right? Whereas in other dances, when you first start, you got to do shit like the way that they ask um, or you're doing it wrong, right? And the person's looking at you like you messed up, right? But it's hard, hardest dance to master because if you really want to make every dance amazing with everyone, you got to learn every single way of moving your body ever so that whoever you're dancing with, you can move in the way that makes the most sense with that person, right? So if you get a tango dancer and you don't have any tango knowledge, you can still dance with them, but it's way easier if you have a ton of tango knowledge, right? Like, um, so, uh, so going back to like, uh, making things universal, like there's two concepts that I always look at with everything like counterbalance or, um, or tone or, uh, musicality, but let's break that down into volume changes, energy changes, all sorts of different ways, phrase changes, all different things we can look at each one of these things. Uh, there's two concepts I come, uh, come at it with. One is to, um, that, the simple way of saying it is get rid of wrong, bad, like even get rid of good and and focus more on like objective statements like this does this. Right. Or you could even say this could cause pain. Right. That's that's very subject or objective. Right. Um, versus this is bad or don't do this or something like that. When you frame things around don't and can't and, and bad, then what you're putting into that person's mind is that when they dance with someone that does that, that person's wrong, right? As opposed to we want to put into their mind, figure out how to rock out whatever your partner does, right? And so, I mean, we can get technical on like, how to do that within like things that are dangerous. And the good thing is that if you do that with somebody, then you're giving them the power to be able to dance with that person that's dangerous and have a safer dance than just being like, well, sorry, it sucks to be you. You, you asked them to dance and you didn't know that they were that bad <laughs> or they jerked you around and now you've got no, nothing to do with it. Right? So it can make the dance safer for people. It also just gives people that awareness of why things, you know, people say, don't do this. Well, why? Like, oh, because it's dangerous. Okay. All right. Let's take, take that into play. Um, you know, some of the things that originally were taught to me as dangerous, as I analyzed them more, I started to realize, oh, well, what if, what if we, you know, when someone presses, like you push back, that's a common thing in the dance. They were saying, don't do that in certain areas, but that's because we never thought about actually pushing back in like a Texas Tommy is a, you put your arm behind the follows back and they say, don't pull up because you could dislocate their shoulder. But if you teach the follow to push down, if someone pulls up, just like you would do in a regular position, now they can save themselves from getting their shoulder dislocated. And of course you, if you were ever to teach something like that, you would want the leads to know like it's dangerous to pull up because if they don't, you could dislocate their arm. At the same time, you got to teach the follows. Here's what, what you do to make sure like if someone does, you're, you're protecting yourself, right? And that all comes from analyzing things in a like, instead of a wrong, bad, in a just like, okay, what, What's the, what's the benefits? What's the negatives of doing it like this? And how do we turn the negatives into, like, how do we make those things that normally we think are bad, uh, how do we make them awesome? Mm -hmm. um, Can you say something about your sort of strategies for, you know, because you're talking about entering a world in which people teach dance in a very particular way and you want to do it in a different way. Yeah. So you're you're entering, there's a, there's a uh, you got to have some sort of strategy to, like, 
to, to do something differently or to fix what, whatever, or whatever, whatever it is you want to do. Can you talk about like what are your ways of actually going about this as a teacher? I'd like clarity on what okay. you mean by that. But mm -hmm. before I do, mm -hmm. I did say there were two things, and I only okay. mentioned oh, one. Please, yeah, talk about the other. Oh, yeah, let yeah, me yeah, mention yeah. the other one mm -hmm. real quick. The other one is, um, uh, look, most things we learn are what I call statically styled, and I want to change them to so that they're reaction ready, right? So that's the simple way of saying it is change static style to reaction ready, which means, again, we talked about counterbalance, Right. Instead of stat at this point in the dance, you go in to counterbalance to come out. Right. It's about learning counterbalance so that you can go in and out with your partner and match your partner or even choose not to match your partner. But be learn the technique so that you have a habit of using that technique in a reactionary way with your partner rather than creating a habit of always doing something the same way. Right. So it's a very different uh, way of learning, of building a habit. It's still building a habit. It's just not building a habit of always being in a certain posture. It's building a habit of having the posture adjust to your partner and to the music. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two kind of concepts is static style to reaction ready mm -hmm. and then uh, change the subjective like wrong and bad to objective mm -hmm. with descriptive benefits. Right. Mm -hmm. Like. Um, but now going on, can you describe yeah. more what you mean by your question? So what I mean is, um, you're, you know, that if, for example, if you go into a room that is full of people who have been taught in ways that are ways that you do not want to teach. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, so there is, they, they've been, they've learned something that you want to help them unlearn or sure. that you want to like, uh, well, I don't know how you want to phrase that, but like, but, um, yeah. but you have a, you have an, like an agenda in this way, in this space. Sure. Right? Sure. So like. What are your uh, what are your strategies that you sort of develop to actually implement that to make to to, to teach in that way? That's yeah, a very general question, I realize. But yeah, I mean, one thing that you got to be really uh, careful and meta on in this concept is like, uh, you, I don't want to make them wrong for what they were doing. Right. It's not wrong what they were doing. There's actually great benefits to why they were taught the way they were taught. Right. What I'm trying to teach them has other benefits. Right. So if they want to get a certain look in their dance, like then style is probably the first thing to focus on. But if they want to be able to have like really great social dances with another person, like and with anyone and any music and want to be able to dance to any music and feel like they're actually interpreting that music, then this other concept what I teach is is what I would recommend, right? And I think when you do that with people and you share with them the benefits of being able to dance with anyone to any music, right? And you show them that. You give them really easy ways to actually accomplish that. And then they're on board, you know? It's really easy for people to get on board if you make it easy. Mm -hmm. that, that I think that's a key thing is, like, people make dance so complex. And, like, when I, you know, if I teach a beginner that's for very first lesson... Right. I only teach them to connect to the music and their partner with the moves they already know. And you're like, but they're new dancers. They don't know any moves, but they've lived how many years of their life? They've already walked for so many years. So I'm going to use walking. They walk forward. They walk backward. That's all I'm going to do is teach them to walk and do it to the music. So then like the cool thing is like if you teach a move to somebody, right, like. They learn that move and then they go out and they dance and they feel like they're within two minutes. They feel bored because like, I don't know any other moves. I can't do anything. Right. If you give them an entire hour of like practicing, taking, just walking something they already do and showing them how to change it to the music. Right. And getting them to really practice, like letting the music guide how they do that walk. Then every song that comes on gives them new ideas because it's no longer them coming up with the ideas. It's the music that's inspiring it for them, right? So it becomes so much easier for them to dance all night long because all they have to do is walk and change it up based on what they hear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, but I guess to answer that question, like how do I get people to get on board with that? Like it's really just teaching the concepts, really looking at, like, what is the universal concept, right? Like, 
um, what and also like what matters. Right. I think that's another thing is people like tend to focus on things that don't matter, you know, like uh, I, and I don't want to say don't matter at all. But <laughs> mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things, right, like posture is one that a lot of people will hammer in early on when you see like 80 year old men with hunched over doing everything like doing the swing outs, doing everything that everybody else is doing, like without the posture. So clearly it's not necessary it's valuable. It can help make things more efficient and effective, but like not, it's not the thing that's going to get them to be able to do what you're asking them to do. So focus on what is the thing, like what is the one thing you want them to get out of this class and how does everything else you share with them, help them with that one thing rather than like trying to do, you know, three different moves as an example is kind of common, right? Come in and be like, all right, you're going to learn these three moves today. Like already, like there's so much they're going to have to learn just to get one of those moves. Like they're going to be overwhelmed and lost, right? Like, and it doesn't mean you can't teach three moves, but what's your focus? What's the thing? If imagine if they know coming into the class, the thing that they're going to learn today, right? Is, the ability to uh, match the volume of their movement to the volume of the music, right? That's the thing that they're going to learn. They're also going to learn three moves, but but you don't even mention that. You just, this is the thing we're doing. And then you take them and you teach them the first move, but as you're teaching them that you're playing with the music volume and showing them how to do that move bigger and smaller based on the the volume of the music, right? Like... Then and then the next move you show them like they can learn that move. But again, you're doing the volume stuff to get them used to that. So a whole hour they got those moves, but they're the secondary side thing. And if you don't get all three moves, you're fine because the only thing you promised them was the volume changes. Right. And they got that. And they and by focusing on that for that whole hour, they come out with something they will actually use in their dancing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I, I want to uh, go back uh, and loop back to sort of that the that beginning moment of uh, you, you said that is the first was it the first exchanges or the first recesses the first exchanges that you were in, uh, uh, the fusion exchanges was, it, was that the where, fusion exchanges yeah, yeah. were the ones that I and yeah, Ivy sort of, Gray put on yeah, yeah. So, so like and, and I know that you sort of your and your, I, I should yeah. say that Ivy Gray and I put on okay. she was the founder okay. <laughs> like I, I never want to make it sound like yeah. I was the founder so yeah, she yeah. founded it yeah I consulted the first one and then co-organized okay um, um, yeah so so uh, I I think that like that moment is going to be probably important for me to sort of think about like those these these sort of like yeah so can you say can you say a little bit more uh, I realize we're sort of like completely switching gears here, but like, can you say a little bit more about the, that early, those early days, and or is that sort of the moment of sort of moving? Because because you had already been doing the house parties before then, and you started doing. That, we yeah. had been doing the house parties. We'd done a few of the, um, we'd done a few of the. Uh, Mihai had done a few of the um, blues tango. What did he call that? I've heard blango. It, it, what he didn't call it that yeah. I, I've heard that as well, but he called it uh, tangoed up in blues. Mm. Tangoed up in blues was his thing. Uh, so he'd done a few of those. Uh, Friday night blues was going on, so there was a weekly place to go blues dancing. Um, and I feel like that's about it. Like at least in in this area, as far as what was happening, like um, and. The fusion exchange was kind of the, um, the uh, maybe the is inspiration the right word or the you know, the catalyst I guess towards like a bunch of different scenes like starting to pop up for fusion, um, so people started taking it back to their home scenes and and building that their own scenes. I think we even like did. Uh, a few like you know talks on how to grow your scene and stuff like that back then um so so who was showing up to those to, to that to the to the, those first exchanges? the first exchange was like i'd say 90 percent lindy hop and like 10 percent well yeah i mean like i mean we have the numbers and the stats if i remember it actually was probably 70 percent 77 percent lindy hop 
Now, that sounds right. Uh, I'm guessing, but I think that sounds actually pretty accurate. Uh, and then, and that's out of all the people that many people knew and were comfortable with Lindy Hop. And then maybe like 30% or 50% were comfortable with blues, right? And so some of them probably knew both. Um, and then like probably like 5 to 10% were salsa. Um, and I don't know if we had any West Coast swing dancers back then. Uh, we probably had maybe 10 to 10 to 30 percent of tango, I would guess somewhere in there. Um, and uh, so the very first one was just a lot like oh, almost everyone knew Lindy Hop. Um, and then that started to trail off. Um, I don't know exactly when, but it definitely like slowly went down to like, I think the last ones maybe maybe 40% new Lindy Hop would be my guess, or 30 or some, somewhere in there. So were, were they playing swing or, at all, or, or is it just, or, or was it like a... We definitely, it, or? No, well, so uh, me and Ivy had different thoughts on what kind of music to play. My, my goal was always to play music that was close enough to the styles that people knew, um, that they were comfortable, but far enough away from it that they had to think, right? So... In my ideal world, we probably wouldn't play a, a Lindy Hop song, or if we did, it would be a surprise. Like, so it was like, like, oh, and like, I'm actually, okay, it makes sense to do Lindy Hop right now. I'm going to focus on that versus like in a normal Lindy Hop dance, you're doing Lindy Hop just because it's the habit, right? Like I want them to, if they do Lindy Hop, it's because it feels like I got to do it, right? That music is calling me to do that, right? And so... Um, so my goal was to not to have too much of any like specific dance and really to kind of like the turquoise, like if we're going to play blues, we're going to play turquoise, like tweak it a little so that the blues dancers in the room have to think, right? Um, Ivy was a little bit more, uh, like she liked having some of those styles of dance, like in the fusion exchange and actually having an hour devoted to, you know, Lindy Hop or blues or and, and even sub genres of that like uh, I can't remember oh like Delta blues or something or um, bar blues I don't know if that's the technical name for it but um, uh, the BB King style stuff um, and uh, so she she liked that aspect of it um, and then we just found that happy medium of ha of having it all that we could. You know, for me, I always liked, I don't think we ever did this at a fusion exchange or maybe we did one set like this, but I always wanted us to have sets that, uh, were around a feeling, you know, like, like this is the one hour badass set and this is the one hour romance set. And this is the one hour, like getting hot and sexy or like, or down and dirty or, you know, like they all have different feels to them. And then you can branch into a lot of different types of music within that. Like you don't have to just play Lindy Hop or blues. You can play all these and just look for the feeling of the song. So, um, so that's, I mean, that's not the music we're getting now, right? Like, so, uh, yeah. so, so how did that, yeah. how did that shift happen? Um, well, and it really depends on where you go, because I, I would say, like, if you go to Sacramento, you'll get a little bit more of that, um, largely because I was a big influence there. Dan was a Lindy Hopper uh, originally, like, so there's more of that there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think the recesses had a strong uh, push towards the electronic music and uh, that side of things, right? Because uh, Justin really likes that, like, you know, electronic music. And, and uh, he's got crazy knowledge in it, too, because, like, for him, it's not just electronic. It's like <laughs> there's house, and uh, I don't even know all the names, but there's, like, so many different styles within it that he can break down. Um, so, like, from an outsider, you might go, oh, it's all electronic music, but he's like, yeah, but it's, like, 20 different varieties going on there. Um uh, so he really impacted the scene a lot, you know, I think, um, building out those recesses, oh my gosh, they, they were magical events, by the way, like, truly, like, some of the, my favorite events in my life have been those, um, and, uh, also, the fusion exchanges were some of my favorites, but in a very different way, like, very different way, 
um, his really had like a, a, a weird magic to them that I didn't understand. Whereas mine, I understood. Like I understood how to make mine good in a way that like his, like I don't know how to do what he does. Um, was there a difference in that? Was was uh, did one have more classes than others, or, or did it? You know? Yeah, uh, fusion exchanges had classes all day. Like uh, well, not all day, but we focused on classes each day. It was actually one of the complaints people had with us calling it a fusion exchange was because a lot of the fusion exchanges uh, were had no classes. Not all of them, but I'd say the vast majority of them were something where like you'd go to the scene, you'd hang out during the day with the people, go to the beach or something, and then dance the night away. Mm -hmm. um, you saying the fusion exchanges did that? No, no regular the, exchanges, we regular Lindy thing, exchanges. Yeah. Before that, Lindy yeah. exchanges. So mm -hmm. when we started calling it fusion exchange, people are like, is it an exchange, though? Because we're doing classes. Isn't that a workshop? Um, uh, which I get that. For me, it was, yes, but we're focusing on the exchange aspect of getting people from all over to travel to it. In fact, every year it moved to a different place so that it wasn't a local event for anyone. It had to be a traveling, like it was for traveling dancers. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, um, yeah, so we did a lot of classes. The recesses, I think at first they didn't do any classes, if I remember correctly. And then, like, they started to do some classes uh, as they went. Um, but theirs are also very more free form, like, almost like you don't even know what the classes are going to be when you show up. You just show up and like, oh, this person's teaching a class. And, oh, it's going to be over here in this, like, open field or something like that, you know. Um, so a very different feel in the classes, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, I feel like the bugs are coming and maybe we should sure wrap it up. But uh, I really appreciate this. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you yeah. bet. Yeah. Cool. Right. Awesome. I'm yeah. sure your version is going to come out great, but if for some reason 